so excited. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. We got a jam-packed day full of a ton of information to help all of you grow your Amazon business. Yeah, we'll open it up some questions. And uh, the only dumb question is the one that you sit there and you do not ask. Ramon. Yeah, man, Ramon, you know me, I'm always asking questions. <laughs> so, so this is something, it's probably the same thing today as it is the people that are brand new here, I don't have a single employee. Mm -hmm. How do you make that, that leap forward and say like, okay, you know what? <coughs> I know that this is going to bring value to me to get that first employee or that second or that fifth, or the next ten. Like, how, how, did, how did that, how did you come up with that determination to say, my business is ready to take on this expense? And, uh, and, and you know, from there. But like, once you have them, once you have those employees, you know, you know that they're bringing in value. But like, most people are afraid, they're afraid to take that jump. Yeah. Right, so how did you come up, how did you uh, convince yourself that it was the right decision? Time. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you always want to be picking and packing in your warehouse? Of course not. I'd rather go out on a beautiful day like today in Miami and be out. Or when I came to the realization from the internal business side, which is I make a lot more money for my business when I'm reaching out to brands, when I'm reaching out to distributors, when I'm sourcing, analyzing products, than I do picking and packing. If you're, Eric and I are always reminding each other if you're doing the same thing every single day, these minute tasks, then something needs to change. If it could be automated, you shouldn't be doing it every day. If you're running a business, you want to be an owner, not an operator. You need to be forward thinking. And so that first step, total fear. Totally get it, but you need to take the risk. Just do it. What's, what's the worst? Okay, if, if, you know, let's say you hire somebody $10 an hour, you have them come in part time, 20 hours, a friend, family, whatever, that's good. That's what we get cash under the table just to kind of test the wars. If in two weeks you don't see results, you can step back. You can step back. And, but if you do, you're going to want to continue that. And it's not like we didn't jump in and say, let's get eight people, let's get 10 people and start one person. One person, Vinny, was working maybe 15, 20 hours. That's it. Yeah. Start small. Baby steps. Because sometimes the miles seem so far away until you start taking these tiny steps. Carlos, you got some questions over there? Yeah, there's a ton of questions all revolving around ungating. But, I mean, just a ton. Like, how to get ungated. Some people are suggesting hiring an ungating service. And, like, what's... You want to repeat the question for that? So, the, uh, the, the question being asked is how to get ungated. Uh, there's a lot of different ways people tell you that, you know, you, you can use a service that's going to cost you money. It will work, but it'll cost you money. Another way of handling it is working with authentic suppliers authorized by Amazon and just putting in a small order. Amazon requires 10 units. You don't need to go and put, you know, you don't need to order a thousand units of a product to get ungated. By units, I mean eight to 10 units of that ace that need to be ordered. So if it's a two pack, 20 units would need to be ordered, right? Um, and that's it. You supply that information, make sure on that invoice you have your Amazon registered business, the Amazon registered business address and name, the phone number, email, and then also that company provides you all of that, that information too. And it's much better if you can get the company to provide the UPC on the invoice. It's a little bit more difficult if it's just their internal skew. The UPC will verify to Amazon that the product you're trying to get ungated in is also the product that's on the invoice. Mm. Well, we'll slide to Vanessa. Well, you got some more yeah. questions there. Going again with the question that uh, Ramon asked um, in your internal and external process, when is the right time to hire someone? Before you, you hire someone, do you build the process or you you build them with them because you mentioned something that you need to track the time For how sure. much time it takes you to pack and pick or For whatever sure. like when did you build those processes and who helped you because you mentioned mentors yes. last night so yes. did you have a special mentor that built that for you and, and consultant or you build it by experience so Vanessa's question was 
Um, for the processes we discussed of tracking metrics and like, when do we decide to do that? Was it with while we were by ourselves with our first employee and when really should you implement that into your business, correct? And then our second question, which we'll touch on is like, who are our mentors, right? Where did we learn this stuff from? So to address your first question, it's like, obviously if you're by yourself, it's tough to track metrics because it's just you, right? But the, I would say start tracking it from the first employee or two, you know, because you want to know how much inventory they can produce. And it's interesting, it's an interesting metric. But up until about 16, 17 employees, for every, like let's say you have two employees and you get four, your business will double, right? If you have four and you'll get eight, your business will double. If you have eight and you have 16, your business will double again. But once you hit like that 16, 17 employee, it's a little tougher to double your business. Um, but, but it's still possible. So, you know, the tracking, it just, you'll know when you need to track your, your processes, right? If it's just you and your house, it's like, you're just being as efficient as possible and you're noting what you're doing, you know? You're like, okay, I need to do this, this, and this, get these 100 units out the door. But then when you start getting two employees, three employees, there's more stuff moving around and you really should start tracking it then. And do you, do you ask questions like, for example, my employees pack everything in 45 seconds. How do I know if that's good enough or not? Like, how do you come up with the right number, like the right time for all the things that you track? Yeah, so you just, you want to track your averages and then consistently get better, right? So you just want to continue to beat yourself because if you're operating efficiently, then you're doing a good job, right? But if you're decreasing the amount of time it takes, so let's say a month ago you are at a minute of product and then this month you're at 50 seconds, the new goal would be like, all right, how can I get this to 40 seconds? And then the next goal would be like 30 seconds. So you're really just trying to beat yourself. Um, and to answer your last question, our mentors, we have this guy, Ernie, became a great friend of mine. I'll just, and, and he owns a large wholesale company, um, you know, 180, $190 million wholesale company. And he kind of took us under his wing. And he, he taught us about, he, he suggested we go exhibit at trade shows. And he taught us, he led us into our warehouse, let us see his processes. He really took us under his wing and taught us a lot about optimization. Do you use multiple companies or is all of your business done through just one seller account? Yeah. <laughs> I mean. So the question is, do we have multiple accounts or not? And we don't, we have one account. We have one account. We want to grow that account as large as possible and having a one very big account allows me to travel to Seattle, meet with Amazon, allows Amazon to travel to our facility. We've had the category managers come visit us, uh, performance come visit us. And the reason for that is because we have a very large account. They wouldn't come visit us if we had 25 smaller accounts. And it provides some incentive. So we continue to focus on one account there's a lot of stories that you could hear online and Facebook about my account getting shut down, but we have worked with literally thousands, thousands of different sellers I've worked with, and some have done some real shady stuff, some real shady, on the line of unethical, <laughs> unethical stuff, let's just, and, and just totally against Amazon terms of services, and I got their account reinstated. So the fact of the matter is you can have one account and continue to grow. You might hear a lot of things that bring fear to you, but the fact of the matter is maybe that person isn't giving you the full story. Alex has a question online too about uh, those who manage the business from Europe and use prep centers. How can we optimize logistics? What you're gonna first wanna do is everything we talked about, which is understand your internal operations and ask questions to different three Ps. You're gonna have to understand, you know, how long from the time I check in is my product gonna be packed and brought to fulfillment centers? What is the cost of prepping? You know, what is the cost of shipping? What if there's any discrepancies? Who handles that? What if there's any damages? What's considered a warehouse damage? What's considered a damage that I'm responsible for? There's a lot of questions you need to ask and you need to shop around. And then as far as it co comes to bringing products in from Europe to US to these prep centers, you're gonna wanna shop. There's so many freight forwarders, so many brokers out there. Reach out, ask the questions, see what the cost is, and then see what the time is. Because sometimes you might get a phenomenal cost, but it's gonna take 60 days to get here on bolt versus 30 days. Mm -hmm. I'd rather pay less and get it here in the US to my prep center in 30. Do you handle multiples inventory during the summer months? Any advice? Don't do it. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the, the shipping process is just, you got to freeze them or do some sort of bubble pack. It's just, it's not, we've done it. For sure. And that's why we're saying don't do it. It's not cost effective. The problem with uh, meltables in the summertime is that we had insulation, we had ice packs in there, dry packs, whatever, you name it. But if it lands on the doorstep of your customer at 8 a.m. in Miami <laughs> and they don't get home till 6 p.m., it doesn't matter what kind of prepping you did beforehand. The package will be looking like my forehead, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All crispy, crispy as hell. But basically, what is a good way to source for products to resell? Still in the first year of the business, many people use tactical arbitrage right now, and that's what I use now. Any advice? Depends really what you want to do. Retail arbitrage, you literally should be going to stores and scanning everything, right? Scan everything and run. Buy it, scan it, repeat. Um, if you're doing wholesale and you're looking for new distributors, Google is the best place to start finding them. And then you can kind of branch off to there, start doing some LinkedIn searches, you know, some Owler searches, which is a great website. Um, so you can kind of Owlers. branch off. Owler. Like owl? Like, ooh. E-R. <laughs> E-R. So one of our members a uh, couple days ago, I don't know if he's here, Mohammed. I saw him in Orlando, I don't know if he made it. But he asked a question, he asked, you know, he's, he was struggling finding suppliers.